Welcome everybody, we're going to start in a second. delighted for you to be here so we uh, are going here together uh, sorry it's very well. okay so I hope you enjoyed yesterday the first day of the ocean decade week so as you all know I'm sure uh, one of the challenges of the ocean decade is to change the relationship between humanity and the ocean and uh, a bit, uh, one of perhaps the major me methodology to do that is ocean literacy. And uh, ocean literacy has changed a lot over the years. Uh, it's uh, moved from being uh, purely uh, uh, science uh, uh, knowledge based and uh, limited to the school environment. And it's now uh, de deployed, <laughs> I would say, in all many possible contexts to try to uh, fill this gap between us and the ocean. So today with our event that is called uh, Diving, you can see there, Diving from uh, Local to Global Ocean Literacy, Exploring, Sharing, Developing Successful Practice to Know, Feel, and Join the Living Ocean, we want to uh, share with you through four uh, very engaging panels some successful stories of how ocean literacy has been used worldwide to create impact to uh, de deal with uh, the, at local level with the, the global challenges of our times. So this is going to be a, a, a hopefully very inspiring event for all of you, but I must say uh, from uh, uh, my side, it's uh, uh, the result of uh, the, the work of a fantastic group of people. Uh, and uh, we, the three of us here, just uh, 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 represent the, the three pr original proposals that were merged to create this event. So I introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Maria Vittoria Marra. Uh, I, am, I, I work at Galway Atlanta Aquaria and uh, for the Irish Social Literacy Network uh, in, uh, in, in Ireland. And I'll be the general mod moderator for today. And uh, I'll, then, I'll pass the, the word to Begonia. I'm Bego, I'm a teacher, and I work at the University of Barcelona, and I was a former uh, PhD researcher here in this house. Um, now I'm conducting the PhD on ocean literacy, of course. But I just wanted to, to remind you that we have a small but very nice poster exhibit. It's up here, and on, you just go up the stairs, and it's in one of the terraces. And there are very nice posters on mm, local initiatives, and some which are not so local. And the authors are here in this room, so after the event, you are invited to go there and visit the poster exhibit. We have also left some post-its and some pencils, so if you want to write comments or questions or leave your contact on the posters, you can also do that. So we encourage you to visit them. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Evgenia Kastanaya, I represent the third proposal. Um, I'm the global coordinator of the ECO program, which stands for the program, the Ocean Decade Endorsed Program for Early Career Ocean Professionals. 
Uh, so two months ago, uh, the EcoProgram Ocean Literacy Task Team and the EcoProgram Ocean Literacy Asia Hub launched a, a big worldwide campaign to collect materials on ocean literacy activities. We were looking for successful stories, innovative approaches um, that people were doing in their ocean literacy work across the globe. Uh, we especially were encouraging applications and submissions from the regions and countries that are normally underrepresented in such discussions around ocean literacy. So in the context of our initiative, ocean literacy would encompass both formal and informal um, education, and we were really looking for some innovative approaches. So we received really a great number of amazing um, submissions. We learned a lot, and some of the people who submitted, they are here in this room, they will talk about the, their work. Um, so the results of these findings will be presented right now, today, and at some other events. So it will be shared on our social media, the so on the social media channels of the ECO program, and at the next big conference, which is the uh, second UN Ocean Decade Regional Conference in conjunction with the uh, West Park International Marine Science Conference, which will happen just in two weeks in Bangkok, Thailand. So we hope that uh, this online space and this in-person space will inspire uh, people to connect, to learn from each other, um, and, and really to create some, some more uh, greater uh, ocean literacy approaches and initiative. So I would like to um, uh, share now the teaser video that uh, we've created on all these amazing initiatives. So let's watch it together. In a world where the ocean self is more critical than ever, a global movement is underway. Welcome to the Eco Program Ocean Literacy Series, an initiative dedicated to inspire change in humanity's relationship with the ocean. Challenge 10 of the UN Ocean Decade calls for transformative action and we are answering the call. Across the globe, innovative projects are already making waves. From teaching programs to community engagement, these initiatives are leading the change, showcasing the power of knowledge and action. Through the ECO Programs Online Campaign, we are gathering stories from every corner of the earth. These stories will be shared, discussed and celebrated at our interactive panel event. Here are just a few of our favorite projects that are part of the series, highlighted for their outstanding innovation. I'm a marine biologist from Tunisia and I am the co-founder of Tunisi a citizen science platform empowering Tunisians to protect their beloved sea. We, were, we managed to turn farmer poachers into the protectors of sea turtles. So through educating them and showing them the importance of sea turtles, especially to their livelihood, and also providing livelihood support for them. So nowadays, 98% of the sea turtle patrollers are farmer poachers. And so we ended up with these beautiful memory maps from kids all around the world showcasing their connection to their local blue space. And I think it's vital because research shows that increased sense of place positively influences environmental behaviour and collective action. And that's what we really wanted kids to start doing is going back to their blue spaces again and again and recognising that that's their personal connection to the ocean. Our aim for this comic series has been to allow the audience to meet the sea creatures through the zen, a child 
animals' eyes and learn of fun facts and threats the animals face through indirect storytelling from the animals' point of view. Our ocean literacy initiative is a theater play and it's called Invisible Diver. So the integration of scientific information in a captivating way was probably the most relevant challenge which was overcome thanks to the strong collaboration between the director and scriptwriter Xavier Miralles and the um, team of scientists at Submon. And the results proved to be effective with science meeting art to raise awareness while leveraging on emotion. Our objectives are clear, to inspire, to equip, to connect and to advance. Together, we'll explore new methods, share knowledge and build collaboration that will shape the future of ocean literacy. Join us on this journey to create a more sustainable ocean. Together, we can make a difference. Thank you all. Maria Vittoria, over to you. Thank you very much, Evgenia. So now we will start with the first panel. And some. <laughs> Sorry, if you please, thank you. So, it's um, the first panel is a, uh, is a, uh, it will be about rem is a, uh, removing barriers in addressing ocean literacy globally. The moderator is Karina Higa from the Eco Program, and we have uh, six wonderful panelists for uh, for this panel: Alicia Perez Porro from the, uh, forgive my pronunciation, Centro de Investigación Ecológica y Aplicaciones Forestales, Patricia Puig from Oceanogami, Antonella Vassallo from the International Ocean Institute, Yolanda Sanchez from uh, Relato and Ocean Grants Program, Daniela Hill from the Fundación Amiguitos del Oceano, and Laura Katib from Guardians of the Blue. So welcome everyone to our panel discussion on removing barriers for addressing ocean literacy globally. And the unique approach is taken by various initiatives to address challenges in this field. Today we have a diverse group of panelists who will share their insights and experience on how innovative approaches such as citizen science projects and local community engagement efforts can bridge gaps in knowledge and empower individuals to actively participate in ocean conservation. So today, um, let's, uh, let's kick off our discussion where each panelist will answer a specific question uh, to, about the project, okay? So we have a limit time, uh, but each one is going to answer one question and then I will open questions for the audience because I guess you guys will have so many questions. Um, to start off, I would like to, um, to ask Yolanda, Yolanda? <laughs> uh, could you please share um, about uh, the Ocean Grants Program, how they address uh, the Support Relatos Network okay, to fund challenges commonly faced by marine uh, education initiatives, uh, ensuring sustainability and longevity in their efforts to improve ocean literacy? Um, uh, this is a, we, we just have three minutes, so it's a quite of uh, elevator pitch uh, thing that I don't like at all. But let's try to, uh, first of all, start to doing the difference between what is the Ocean Grants Program and what is RELATO. So RELATO is the Latin American Marine Educators Network that it was created uh, thinking about how to empower community who is doing ocean literacy in Latin America 
to support them in make more visible the results that they have doing ocean literacy. So um, thinking about the, uh, and, and the Ocean Grants program is a new UK government program to fund communities in the developing countries to uh, implement projects in conservation and uh, poverty reduction. So thinking about how to cross the barrier about funding, I have this uh, very uh, amazing two points of view about. Firstly, let's think about Relato. So let's think about how to empower the community, trying to connect them, what Relato does, connect them, trying to understand what barriers they have, what kind of uh, challenge they face, what kind of support they can give the, each other. And that kind of thing is sharing all together. We have 1,000 members in, in the Relato network now. So having this uh, time for sharing is a time for empowering ourselves because we realize that we have um, already a lot of experience to improve how are we doing ocean literacy in Latin America. So that is so important to convince funders about why we have to fund, not only just give a talk on the community, but how to analyze the context we are going to work, to work with, how to analyze the, the program we want to design, how to test it, how to implement, how to evaluate, and how much time is it and how much money is it. So having all this um, idea and power inside the community, inside the ocean literacy community, you can go to the, to the um, grants opportunity as the ocean grants opportunity. So going through to, to the other side, I think that this um, new program in ocean grants um, and uh, conservation funding, it's very uh, thinking about how to support communities to get funds for that kind of project. So it's not focused only in ocean literacy, but it's focused on how to empower communities. So absolutely understanding how much ocean literacy is important on that. I think that the, some of the most important ideas that the Ocean Grant Program has is like, uh, we are developing a lot, of, a lot of strategies to support communities to apply for the grant, like having webinars, help desk, or all the, those ideas, but also thinking about how to set the rules to make the things easier for the people who want to apply for that kind of grants. Mm -hmm. So I think that just uh, having the both points of view, we can understand a little bit better how to try to face these barriers in getting funding. It's not easy. It's uh, the, the topic that everybody will talk mm -hmm. in all the sessions, that we still have the problem of funding everywhere in, in all the topics. But let's try to understand how to uh, strengthen organizations so they can be more powerful asking for the money and how to they, they, our organizations can also try to have and share the vision from the community to understand how to make easier these applications in, in funding. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, can you see the, the QR code over there? So, we, pre we prepared for uh, each panelist, we prepare, we prepare uh, like um, a story. So, you can access each story of the, each project through the, uh, through the QR code. So, yeah, if you are curious about each project, so yeah, please check it out. So, uh, for the next panelist, uh, uh, would you like to ask Laura? <laughs> Guardians of the Blue has been doing remarkable work in Lebanon in addressing ocean literacy challenges. Can you share how your organizations tackle the low ocean literacy rates? Thank you. So, um, yeah, um, we're facing a lot of barriers in addressing ocean literacy in Lebanon. Uh, obviously, the current political economical crisis, the constant instability, and uh, the lack of uh, public governance and infrastructures um, are all having an impact on the country's capacities in terms of marine research and marine education, formal and non-formal. So um, when we created Guardians of the Blue, it was out of passion and out of necessity. Um, and since the beginning, it's been uh, three years and a half now, uh, we've been partnering with uh, Xifias Diving, uh, the only scuba diving club in uh, Biblos. Um, and so uh, we started with what we had, uh, which was 10 years of underwater footage taken by the club uh, around the coast of Biblos. And this was really valuable because it allowed us to create a kind of a baseline to know uh, what is in our coast, uh, which species, and to see how it changed um, over the past 10 years. So we compiled this information with uh, the scientific research that has been done in the rest um, of the country, and uh, that's how we started. Um, so cr we created uh, educational posters and a big uh, marine species poster uh, for the club to educate and train divers uh, about their sea so they can become kind of uh, uh, ambassadors and they raise awareness among their peers. Uh, and we're also using all of that data 
uh, and footage to create uh, posts on social media and on our website. Um, so we're sharing information on the different marine species we have in Lebanon, and we're also making um, awareness campaigns about certain topics. So uh, last summer it was about sharks, mm. uh, and we're also sharing information about general uh, marine science. Um, so all of our content is available in English and Arabic, and sometimes also in French. Um, and so far we reached around 20,000 people, um, and we always get uh, very positive feedback because it's quite rare to get underwater footage of the Lebanese coasts. Um, and so there's so many people in Lebanon that, that think that the coast is empty and dead uh, because they never see what we see when we dive. Um, so this is kind of our way of uh, removing this visual barrier together with the knowledge barrier. And uh, we also work with divers and the local community of uh, fishermen uh, to organize underwater cleanups. And so we use these times to uh, talk about the impacts of marine pollution and the importance of keeping the sea clean. And uh, we're also working on uh, raising awareness about the lionfish invasion. So um, we're trying to democratize the consumption of lionfish and its hunting, and we're also making lionfish jewelry. Um, and so finally, uh, one of our most recent projects is uh, working with the municipality uh, of Biblos um, in collaboration with the municipality of uh, Saint-Jean-Cap-Ferrat uh, in the south of France. And so we're gonna organize workshops uh, both both in the sea and in the classroom uh, with the use of uh, both uh, cities. Um, and yeah, just the, our long-term <laughs> goals is kind of um, to get funding to create a sea school uh, in Biblos and also for the future marine protected area of Biblos and to produce a marine documentary series uh, about the sea in Lebanon. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, now, I would like to move on to Antonella. Yeah. Can you explain more about how the IOI Ocean Academy emphasizes on ocean knowledge that related to local culture, helps people uh, in neglect communities yeah, uh, feel more connected with the ocean? Okay. Thank you very much. So, I'm from the International Ocean, ocean Institute and uh, as well as capacity development and training for ECOPS. We recently devised a, uh, an ocean literacy level, if you wish, program called the IOI Ocean Academy. And this idea came up as, first of all, it was a 50th anniversary program of the IOI. So in order to celebrate and emphasize how far we had gotten and to continue working with those people who had graduated from the IOI training over the previous five decades, the IOI Ocean Academy was created as a way to, for even the alumni of the IOI, to give back to their communities. And one thing we noticed is that very often, and it's a barrier that Laura mentioned, that there is material out there it's not necessarily available in those languages which the local communities, maybe some of them in vulnerable environments, which are at the forefront of uh, climate and ocean threats. Um, there is no material out there which people in these communities can access. So we created the Academy, which removes barriers to ocean knowledge, which are created by funding, so it's free for all our audience to attend, by language, so the Ocean Academy is offered in, I believe, 17 different languages and growing. So, in fact, a shout out to our Ocean Academy director from Morocco, who's here, and they will be offering, for example, um, locally targeted 20-hour online modules for people from Francophone African countries at an ocean literacy level, which I think we, we like to say that it doesn't discriminate for or against anyone in the generational um, age, age range. And literally, we always say, if you're interested and you have a smartphone and you have a Wi-Fi connection, you can join. You can join and you can learn. I think one of the things we really like about these Ocean Academy modules, which are offered, you know, 
in, I think we'll have about 40 this year, this year alone, in many different countries all over the world. What we like about that is that they are a forum, not only for learning to proceed from local experts about local situations, but it's also a forum where they can, where people can ask their questions. It's 10 seconds. 10 seconds. <laughs> people can ask their questions, and we notice as well that these, these questions, this involvement empowers them to go and be really proactive about what, and bring positive change to their community. So I, I think it's, it's a project which really goes deep into the heart of local communities with issues that interest them and that they can be empowered to do something about. Okay, so amazing. Yeah, um, yeah uh, we need to have this access to different languages, but also not um, in different idioms, but different languages to talk with, for example, private sector. So, and I would like to ask to Patricia uh, about her project with private sector. For example, Oshonagami. Uh, how does Oshonagami approach of conducting team building workshops contributed to overcome the challenges of engaged private sector in marine conservation efforts? Thank you very much for the invitation, and it is great to, to share the, um, our experience engaging the, the different stakeholders for ocean literacy. So I'm the founder of Oceanogami, and the idea of Oceanogami actually started when I was working in, in Galapagos. I saw that there was a lot of connection of the people with the ocean, and there was a lot of respect for the nature there. And then I came back to Barcelona, and I realized that we we were, were at the moment, we were still living in the, we say in Spanish, the espaldas al mar, in the back, the back to the sea. So we were not really looking at the, at the sea, at what we have here, actually. And I wanted to ask you, okay, we are quite biased audience because we are here because we care about the sea, but how many of you have been doing the snorkeling, have, have done snorkeling in Barcelona? Can you raise the hand? Okay, wow, okay. I was thinking it was going to be more, actually. <laughs> so, so yeah, this, this, this raised my, my point, no? Of this, still, I know some people yeah, come from abroad, so they didn't have the chance, but if you have the chance these days, I encourage you, as a, it's a amazing weather at the moment, to do a snorkeling in Barcelona. I can recommend you where, where to go and with who to go. So, so then, um, that's why I founded Oceanogami, to engage the different stakeholders for the marine conservation. And particularly, I found that there was a need in the private sector. The private sector, even if the company doesn't have any relationship to the marine environment, they have to do, the employees can do something to protect the ocean. So we work with actually any company you know, that wants to do something to protect the ocean. And we work with the employees. So we do also other things, but one of these projects uh, with the companies is um, that we go actually here in Barcelona and also in different places in Europe, but particularly we focus a lot in Barcelona and with the collaboration of the Marine Science Institute of Barcelona as well. Um, we go to see the impact that we are causing. So we think uh, this is a team building that activities that you were mentioning. So this is the way that the employees, they see the impact that we are causing. For example, with single use plastics, that there are still a lot in the, in the coast, uh, we collect it uh, with citizen science approach, so we share this with the scientists. And then if they see for the first hand, they see the impact, and they also go snorkeling to see the marine biodiversity that is in Barcelona, it's quite amazing, I recommend you. So this is a way to engage, no? and I think for any sector, for any person, people no, in general, um, it's important to see, it, to really care, to protect it. So this is a bit of the message that we want to give, no? So if you see it, you see why it's important to protect, then you see the impact that we are causing, and then you see, you have to think about, okay, how, what I can do to protect, no? So then we can, for example, just give in a short example and I finish. Um, so if you, you find us um, earbud in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beach, no? For example, you have to think, okay, how this came? So this came because somebody threw it in the toilet, then went to the river, and then went to the sea. So just an example, just to 
think, okay, maybe we can avoid it some, somehow, no? So this is a way that every one of us, and of course this has to be from all the sectors, not only the citizens, but uh, this is a way to think, okay, how we can do something, even if it's little. So this is what we do with the, with the companies. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. So we are talking about uh, the relationship with uh, humanity and the ocean. So, but how uh, we measure the behavior change? <coughs> so I would like to ask Daniela, né, can you elaborate on how the ESRA uh, methodology effectively measures the <laughs> internalization of ocean literacy concepts? Né? within coastal communities and evaluate the short-term change in habits, habits and actions towards marine conservation in your community. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I'm from Ecuador and we're very excited to be here. So first of all, we, I need to talk about like uh, before COVID we had another program and we had another methodology which had uh, three steps. It was awareness, uh, hands-on, which we were used to go to the beach, you know, for picking up the garbage, and a final stage of art, uh, art session. And in two years that we were doing this methodology, we were able to reach more than 10,000 kids. But then, in, during COVID and during those years, we were thinking about, okay, you know, we are missing something. We want to know what happened with these kids that they were part of the project. So we were, you know, asking ourselves and we did like a team building um, uh, uh, initiative and we were like talking about how can we know what happened with these, you know, people that we are working with. You, how, what's the change? For us, it wasn't not enough to have this total number total number of the beneficiaries that we are reaching but you know we wanted to go beyond so um, then with this new vision we started to create uh, or updating this uh, old methodology into ESRA. ESRA uh, in Spanish means explora, siente, reconecta, actúa which is uh, explore and explore aims for exploring the ocean literacy principles Okay. No, don't scare me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to explore the, the principles, uh, feel it's like you know it's a, Ezra brings you to um, inter, uh, like in, it's a introspective uh, analysis, a personal introspective analysis. So it calls you to do action, not just to wait for you know governments, other <coughs> institutions, NGOs to act, but you know you do it for yourself. So these uh, different phases from Ezra uh, feel is like, okay, let's, it's about a lot of emotions and you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, we bring together these emotions and construct this connectivity with water that we all have, sometimes that we forget. And uh, Reconecta, it's like recon reconnection. And it, uh, it goes like putting in presence our ancestrality and our culture that we have in a lot of places lost, maybe, uh, because of colonization. Uh, and, okay, and, uh, uh, and act. It's like, you know, the call to action, how these, these kids who are in this 11 month process are reaching uh, outreach in their community through their projects that they ourselves, they create. So at the beginning, we are doing uh, this survey, so we have this baseline, and during this process of ESRA and this 11-month process of ocean literacy that we are building together, you know, we all bring perspectives and emotions and thinking for constructing uh, these uh, concepts that are very new. Uh, so we have this, for example, uh, the percentage of people who are uh, think or they're linking to the ocean, about ocean literacy knowledge, uh, the, ch the changing behavior, what, what are they doing? So we have observations, evaluations, and other surveys so we can manage the information that, like a before and after. Like, okay. like try to summarize. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think uh, we have a lot of to talk with Daniela because uh, it's very inspiring that this methodology, this metrics that we can use for many projects. Uh, based on uh, behavior change. 
But move on to the next panelist. Um, we um, we work. Ocean literacy needs to reach different actors, and stakeholders. Then, and I would like to ask Alicia. Alicia has a very different research <laughs> uh, field, there, and she works with different stakeholders. So I would like to ask you, how does promoting né, your project helps researchers, policymakers, and decision makers understand be, uh, better how land and ocean ecosystems are connected? This understanding can improve ocean knowledge and encourage better ways to manage the environment. Can you? Explain a little I will bit. try. I will yeah. do my best. <laughs> In three minutes. In three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for being bold enough to invite uh, Terrestrial Ecology Research Center to this panel. So I'm the exotic element of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> so for those not living in Barcelona, I am the scientific coordinator of CREAF, which is a research center in terrestrial ecology that mainly focuses on forestry. So by training, I'm a marine biologist, and we are three marine biologists in this research center. And uh, one day we were having lunch and we were talking and we were saying what Patricia just said about like, why even researchers sometimes were giving our backs to the, to the ocean. And we started talking um, about something that I have to say, I didn't create this name, but we started talking about turquoise ecology. And we started talking a couple of years ago when it was COP25 that was supposed to be in Chile and that ended being in Madrid. COP25 was supposed to be the first blue COP. And Chile um, created this name of turquoise ecology because Chile has a lot of coast and also has a lot of mountains and, and, and land. So they created this turquoise diplomacy that now is transformed into turquoise um, foreign affairs strategy. And inspired by that, we started creating our turquoise ecology narrative, which is basically, and how, like Sylvia Earle uh, said, right, there's no blue, no green. So we said, well, no blue, no green, and what happens in the green doesn't stay in the green, affects the blue. Hence, the blue plus the green, turquoise. So, and <laughs> in case you needed the explanation. <laughs> So, so uh, we started creating this narrative of like, well, there's a couple of researchers at CREAF that, that they are like studying things that have a great effect on the, on the ocean. So let's start uh, putting a name of this. And because what I, basically what I do is that I do science for policy and science diplomacy. So I talk to a lot of decision makers and policy makers. And I started informally talking to those people <laughs> to see how they were creating their policies and legislation. And I saw, uh, not, I'm not going to say that I was surprised because I was not, but <laughs> everything was completely separated, right? And internationally, we are always talking about breaking the silos. We are talking always in silos. So um, what we are looking for with this turquoise ecology that right now, more than a project, is a narrative that is permeating in our strategy and we, are start, like, we started talking to other research centers like this one, like the ICM, to see how can we join forces. And when we talk to legislators and decision makers and policy makers, so they consider this as a whole, as a turquoise, not as a different silos for green, for blue, for climate change, for biodiversity. So, and, and the idea is to like, do our little thing on breaking these silos and construct a turquoise a narrative that is going to yeah, make them understand basically that what happens in the green doesn't stay in the green. And when you create certain policies, you need to take into consideration not only the effects in the green, but also the effects in the blue. And it's very much a work in progress. It's very challenging, as you probably know. But hence, here we are. So wish us luck and join us if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So now I guess uh, the audience uh, 
is very curious about the, all these amazing projects we present today. So I will open a few minutes uh, for the audience to ask some questions. So we have uh, two microphones around here. So just um, put your hands up and, yeah, and ask. No, no questions. Really? So you guys understood everything. Yeah? They explained very well, yeah. <laughs> I will give it the last chance. Last chance? Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, really interesting. Oh. All were really interesting, but um, I have a question to Antonella uh, about uh, her tool, if uh, she can explain a little bit more uh, how it works, uh, uh, where is it accessible, uh, for projects, for example, and so on. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your question and your interest. I'll try and make this short. Um, the Ocean Academy started because uh, we had a lot of people graduating ECOPS from our capacity development programs. They came back to us, they indicated that, uh, you know, while the program was very interesting, interdisciplinary, Something they also got from the program was the awareness of needing to give back to their communities. <laughs> the alumni come from all over the world, and thus the Ocean Academy, which is the ocean literacy level pro project, reflects that. So what we did was we created a program to work with our alumni. We trust the alumni that they, who themselves are expert professionals in their own field, will be able to take knowledge back into their communities, translate it into the local idiom, the local languages. And just to give you an idea, for example, in Sri Lanka, they work in the local languages. In the Maldives, they deliver the programs in Divahi. In India, we have Hindu and uh, uh, Marathi. So a lot of different people with different languages and, and really able to understand their communities, the knowledge they need, and give it back. Barriers we noticed were language, which we have done our best to overcome, but also access. How easy is it for anyone, a citizen, to be able to drop everything and go to a specialized course? Sometimes it's really not that easy. But if you're able to connect online, to this, and it costs you nothing except a bit of time and attention, then of course the uptake is much, much easier, if you wish. Um, the other thing we emphasize a lot in these projects is that the, we strongly believe that in order for us to achieve Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, people have to come on board. And people come on board truly when they're interested, when they're invested. You know, in the jargon, it's ownership and empowerment. But, but the reality is, if you know about something, you care about something, if you care about something, you're usually motivated to do something about it. And that is what underpins, really, the project. Bring information as easily as possible to the target communities, and slowly, slowly, drop by drop, that change will and does come. Um, I'm glad to say it's been a very successful project over the years. Uh, thousands have joined. Unfortunately, there's a lot more interest. We, we want to do more. We will do more. And uh, in a summary, it's but happy to speak more about it with you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so last chance, last question. Yeah. OK. Hello, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I think the, the, the concept of turquoise ecology is very powerful. So I was thinking, I was thinking it should be introduced into the educational sector because I think it's a very good thing to talk about, especially in landlocked areas where they have special difficulties um, in treating the ocean because they say, okay, we live uh, thousands of miles from the ocean, no? So perhaps we should introduce it also in the educational sector, in the formal and informal educational sectors. Yes, yes? I, mean, I, I cannot it? agree more. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, and also, you know, like I, I always think about my kids about that because sometimes we're in the forest 
and my kids are obsessed with the ocean. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and and like and they <laughs> and they pick up the trash and they say, "Mommy, I'm also saving the ocean." It's like, "Yes, you are." <laughs> because whatever you do there has an effect. So I think that okay. it can also be, you know, a way to connect Thing, uh, kids that are really far away from the ocean yeah. with the ocean and yeah. because this is what we want, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. If, if I can be, say a, sm a small comment about this because this actually reminds me. Some years ago, I did my Erasmus in, in Trieste and I had the best lesson ever. It was a lesson about, um, about algae, actually, mm -hmm. but we were outside, outside the university where there were trees and he was explaining, the teacher was explaining ecology uh, comparing the ecology of the trees or the, you know, for the forest and the ecology you know, of, the, of the algae. You know. So I think this is something that you can do yeah, everywhere, even, yeah. even if you are not in the sea, no? if you are not close to the sea. I, I can add something. Yes. <laughs> Here in, in this house, at the website of the ECM, you can find a very nice game, board game, which is called Land or Sea. Yeah, and it's no. just what you're mm, talking about, Patricia. So. Exactly, yeah. And I, I know that book. It's in the entrance. I know everybody yeah, can take it, exactly. actually. Yeah, it's a comic. It's really good. You can yeah. have a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, I will challenge my panelists today, okay, with one question. Are you prepared? <laughs> no. no? Uh, <laughs> throw it at us. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, we identified some common uh, barriers on ocean literacy, and one of them is the generational barriers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have seen many initiatives targeting youth, mm -hmm. but there is a need uh, to engage other generations as well. So, how can educational institutions, community organizations, and government collaborate to promote intergenerational dialogue and participation in ocean literacy activities. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a trick. <laughs> a trick question. Okay. Shall we? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I always think that everyone here, everyone, everyone here, who makes any decision of any sort throughout the day has some deciding power on what happens with our world, with our ocean, with our climate. With that in mind, then I think it's excellent, it's a good move to target all generations. Whether it's the parents who hold the shopping power of the family, whether it's the children who are going to be tomorrow's leaders, whether it's the people maybe towards the end of their uh, maybe uh, careers and things like that. We all have, I think, we all of us have a say in how things are going to be from this point forward every single day. And I think that's what ocean literacy is, learning about the impact of the ocean on you, but also your impact on the ocean. So anything that can give more information around that should be done. Mm -hmm. Language mm -hmm. generation, policy makers, um, forestry people. <laughs> it's all part of it. <laughs> we can't leave anyone out, right? Yeah. 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 If I can come in, yeah, I yeah. totally agree with you, yeah. <laughs> actually. And yeah, it's important to engage all the different stakeholders for the marine conservation and, and also find a common, a common ground. No? Um, because of the interests of everyone, no? for the ocean, for example, the tourism sector, they have the interest um, for doing activities in the ocean, but they also want to have it protected so they can keep doing their activities. So everyone, you know, I have to find a common ground that maybe it's not the um, pure conservation of the place, but it's a good proper management with the different stakeholders. So I think this is important to, to consider when we are talking about marine conservation and ocean literacy. Okay. I would love to add a couple of ideas to that. So um, I think that one of the, for me, most important uh, new ideas that I try to promote all the time, and I will ask all the people here to, to try to implement, it's like to start to, to talking about the, gener the future generations, like give, yeah, giving them all this uh, responsibility about that we, have, we need to teach them because we, they are going to save the planet. Like, we have to start, stop with this uh, speech. 
And um, because of all the eco anxiety we are generating and you know, all the, the, the ideas that they have of, about how to, to do it. But also thinking about methodologies, like first of all, we need to understand really well what is the context that we are going to work with. And it doesn't matter if kids, uh, fishermen or fisherwoman or policy maker, but we need to really understand what is the public and then really understand their interest because sometimes the ocean is not part of the interest. So how can we connect our interests and their and how can we design something, how we design a methodology that could be useful? And thinking about that, game is always a good thing to do. <laughs> Even if they are uh, adult people, because sometimes we think that, okay, so there are fisher women, we have to give a talk, it's not a game. But we can use the same methodology for five years old kids and uh, for 65 people in the, in the community. Exactly the same methodology, different deep in the, in the knowledge. Um, but uh, we all of us want to participate in things that are interactive and, um, give us the opportunity to think, to exchange ideas. So let's think about the context, let's be very well think about the methodologies we use, and let's try to measure the impact as Daniela uh, does. So that's some of Thank the Thank you. Oh, sorry, we don't have time, I'm <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> sorry. No worries. But thank you all for your, um, your experience and ideas. Um, and hope that the ideas shared today will inspire further actions uh, towards a more ocean literate society. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all so much for these fantastic stories of uh, examples of our uh, overcoming barriers in uh, ocean literacy. Now we'll uh, have a slight change. We go to panel three that is about ocean literacy and ocean science. So I want to invite uh, the mo uh, panel moderator that is uh, 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 Giuseppe Luis Pellegri from here, from ICM SIC. And then uh, we have four panelists that are Silvia Gomez Mestres from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Dine Parchina from Eurogus, Donata Canu from the Italian Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics, Maria, and Maria del Carmen Garcia Martinez of the Spanish Institute of Oceanography. And please don't forget to check the QR code on the TV screen. Okay, good day. I'll use these micros, I think they sound fine. Uh, well, it's a pleasure being here, this opportunity of moderating uh, this second panel. I realize that I'm the first male that has appeared on, on, on a scene. This uh, endorses our feminine side, which is what we all have to promote, no? This is, uh, not exclusive of women, but also men. We can have this feminine and curator side, no? which is so important. It's a real pleasure uh, being here uh, and uh, trying to moderate the, this panel with uh, these uh, four wonderful scientists. They come from all fields, from social to natural sciences. And they'll tell us a little bit about their experience Related, related on how to, to promote ocean literacy from the scientific perspective. You know that in science uh, we are uh, probably don't have a preparation on, on uh, communicati communicating ocean literacy. We are not, we don't have typically uh, this background. Our background is in natural sciences. We also don't have typically the resources, projects that we handle are of limited extent in time, and we don't have structural uh, resources at uh, uh, agency levels. And, and further, usually this type of, of uh, tasks are not positively evaluated in the evaluations that uh, represent our promotion. No? So, so it's, it's great having them here and, and seeing the, their, their experiences on how to promote ocean uh, literacy from uh, the scientific point of view to, to 
the general public and scientists as well, no? uh, because we also uh, have to, to get into that direction. So uh, our four speakers are uh, uh, Dina Eparkinov, uh, she's a specialist on science policy stakeholder uh, mediations, uh, um, uh, Mari Carmen uh, Garcia, marine biologist uh, and uh, uh, currently director of the Instituto Español de Serrafía, the largest uh, uh, Spanish marine uh, institute and, uh, and very much engaged in ocean literacy and communication. And uh, Donata Canu, she's a marine ecologist with uh, an emphasis on anthropology, the connections between the, 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 uh, the land and sea. And, and uh, our, uh, uh, far, far farther from me, is uh, Silvia uh, Gomez Mestre. She's a social anthropologist specialized in coastal communities. So uh, I'll uh, start with uh, Dina, please, if you can explain what is your success story, how you transmit your, the, this ocean literacy from the scientific point of view. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm uh, really delighted to be here. And um, representing uh, Eurogos, European Global Ocean Observing System, and we have a working group and a decade project, which is called Scientists for Ocean Literacy, and working group on ocean literacy. And I'm happy here to share the stage with three, two other members of our working group, Mari Carmen and Donata, and uh, kudos to Norin as well, who is in the room, who is another member of the working group. Overall, we bring together 25 organizations in Europe. And uh, what do we do together? We actually uh, try to promote exactly that. That ocean literacy is not where only women are involved yeah. because they are caring for everything and they can make choices against their career sometimes. Uh, that ocean literacy is really accessible, uh, really accessible in, in, in genuine sense. And I was really inspired by some of the examples in the previous panel that we uh, reach out not only to people in their family time when they don't know what to do with their children, but we really work with professional environments, with governments, with local authorities, with businesses. Um, that we also train scientists and in, in involve scientists, in encourage scientists to become ocean literate, uh, literacy advocates and uh, champions. Uh, that we are not, uh, you know, shoemakers whose children are without shoes. Uh, as scientists, uh, we also feel ourselves empowered and recognized as ocean literacy uh, actors. And of course, uh, the, the career uh, element is very important. Uh, it comes also with lack of funding, lack of recognition of ocean literacy as a strategic activity, even though it is so uh, sexy and attractive, and we hear it a lot now in scientific context, in reality, uh, things are, people are not uh, so easily involved because it is not helping them to, to build their career, to uh, have influential uh, articles and papers published, uh, etc. So uh, here we are, and I'm uh, really happy to have this uh, discussion uh, with Joseph and all the panelists. So looking forward to see what the others say. Wonderful. Let's make this flexible. That sounds wonderful. Mary Carmen, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me. And congratulations, Jose, because you are the only man at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know why we are all. Well, there there so, are many, many, so many in the audience. So. Uh, there are a lot in the audience, but somehow I don't know why women are really more involved in this. So maybe we can change this. Somehow we have to work on this. Uh, I was thought to, to talk about one special project that there are a lot of them in the Spanish Institute of Oceanography. We are around 850 people. Probably you know many of our projects. One of them is Oceanicas that is really famous because we, we try to talk about women in marine sciences. But today I would like to talk about another one is called Mariona, it's a specific project that is held in the, the north of Spain, in Gijón, a small city, it's not a very big one. And we noticed that we had some problems because if we have some open days in our institutes, they are always the same schools because there, there are some specific teachers that are really interested in marine sciences, for example. And we decided to do something different and to bring, or to, to take our institutions to the streets, to the neighborhoods, but not only to the schools. We work with the schools. We have some scientific projects with the schools for children 12 to 14 years old. We have some specific activities with them, with the smallest one. But we also, during the same time that 
At the same time, we are doing some activities at the school. We are doing some activities in the neighborhood. For example, we use the shops. You can use the, the screens, the windows in the shows to send some tricky messages, some interesting images, just, just to say the ocean is here. You can learn a lot about that. You can learn about marine pollution, biodiversity, climate change, anything. And at the same time, we also give some talks in the, some specific places with the, surrounding these children that they are doing some specific projects in the school. So I think it's a really nice project. We are really happy about that. And we are searching just to see what is going to happen in the future. But I'm sure we will we'll have perfect and really, really nice results. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, please, uh, Renata. Sure, uh, so first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's a really uh, pleasure to be here and to, to hear all these uh, examples and stories about uh, what uh, we are doing uh, uh, for the ocean and uh, for um, tra um, transferring in the information and getting the information also from the people that are in the ocean and uh, so creating this link between us and the ocean. And uh, <clears throat> I, I'm from Italy, from the National Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics. Um, uh, our institute uh, has a, um, speci a specific uh, department that uh, devotes to the research in the ocean and the sea uh, from the different perspectives. So biology, biogeochemistry, physics, uh, with the observations, modeling, so hard science. But um, <clears throat> in the recent year, we uh, were get more and more engaged in ocean literacy, um, not only because some how it is uh, also requested by the projects to engage with the stakeholders and with the, the institutions, with uh, uh, the enterprises, and, uh, but also because we really believe that uh, it's a key uh, to um, improve the conditions of the sea. So um, we um, did a lot of traditional talks and seminars uh, in uh, meetings with schools uh, often the same schools because uh, those that have the teachers that are uh, more willing to participate. But um, what I want to, um, to present here briefly is a, a festival that it's now at the fourth here that is um, done in Trieste and in the wider region. Trieste is a, a city located by the sea, but the festival was done also inside, inland, thus uh, uh, meaning to, uh, to connect uh, the land and the sea uh, toward this uh, turquoise ecology, turquoise. Um, <laughs> and um, so the festival w was um, called, uh, is called Mare di Refare, that recalls uh, a very silly game that uh, we did as a child in Italy, that is uh, see, say, do. Um, so just for starting from the name, is something that has to do with the game and the, with the art, because this festival um, in the fourth, different fourth um, um, years, engage with artists to, uh, to promote, uh, for example, exhibitions, art exhibitions, uh, um, that were then uh, um, moved around in the libraries, in uh, uh, cafeterias, and so on to go inside, to, do, to, to improve the connection with the city. And uh, of course, we had also traditional talks uh, focusing on different topics. topics. Topics that are less recognized, like for example, the microbial life in the sea, the deep sea, and uh, the uh, topic that uh, means that the, the sea starts in the city. So these were the topics, uh, and uh, these were the ways that we in place to try to improve this uh, ability to communicate because it's not very uh, often easy to engage people, especially in a town that are very exposed to events related to the sea, as Trieste. So we, we really need to, to engage also with people that are, are able to engage with the emotions of the people and uh, to improve the connection. Sorry, I get I was long. No, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Well, so we moved a little bit from the uh, stakeholders and the national uh, agencies to these public spaces and these 
communion with people through festivals and actions. And then I think Sylvia's going to tell us a little bit for, about her experience using new technologies like digital platforms. Digital platforms, yes. Well, I'm going to talk uh, about the digital platform that we have designed in uh, the frame of a uh, European project, Empower Us. Um, and, uh, it, well, it's called Nature Cap. And it's for learning about the marine protected area of Cap de Creus. And we use this digital plat plat platform as a tool for ocean literacy and knowledge sharing, but to foster action oriented knowledge that we think that is paramount to be effective in ocean literacy. Digital platforms make it possible to reconcile scales of knowledge. Uh, at the crossroads between social and natural science and to make society an agent of change. Because I think that we think that ocean literacy has to be this purpose, to uh, make society an agent of change for changing um, the, uh, our way to relate with the ocean. Uh, so a uh, digital platform is uh, effective because it uh, can go beyond geographical or physical, cultural, and social boundaries. And uh, then uh, allow us also to incorporate a uh, new idea of science, more or less. Uh, we produced previously to the design of this digital platform, knowledge assessments in the marine protected area of Cap de Creus. Uh, these knowledge assessments showed that regardless of age, income, and level of knowledge, it was the conservationist ideas and the value of cultural uh, embedded in natural heritage that was paramount to uh, foster pro-environmental behaviors that uh, may change the way uh, we relate to the ocean. So uh, this is the, the idea of action-oriented knowledge that claims for this holistic integration of social science and natural science, considering science as one marine science, embracing different forms of expression, either art, late knowledge, technology, or assessments in a laboratory or modeling. So science, uh, we realize that that should be understood as forms of knowledge in plural that necessarily refers to different scales from the local to the global. Understanding the local, this subjective uh, um, expression of the, the, the nature of the environment of the ocean that is qualitative. This is the tangible dimension that has to be articulated with this understanding of the global effects of human beings on the environment that it refers to the objective, the quantitative, that, uh, well, is the intangible uh, dimension. Both dimensions uh, we realize that that is uh, important that be uh, in articulation, yes, in dialogue. Another point that uh, we wanted to transmit is that being literate uh, does not necessarily mean being respectful of the ocean. It is also necessary to change our conception of nature to change this way we relate to the ocean. Often, uh, Western societies have an idea too much anthropocentric of the nature. And you will say, wow, a social anthropologist saying this. <laughs> yes, because indigenous people uh, are not so uh, anthropocentric because they have another, uh, another uh, way to relate according to their cosmologies that is more reciprocal with the environment, with the ocean. So in our societies, we have uh, our society, in Western society, we have uh, the idea of the ocean as provider of well-being. But what's well-being? So we need to change also this conception of well-being rooted in the comfort, leisure values typical of Western society that is partly linked to the idea of nature consumption and dependent on the consumption of the, our planetary resources. We need to produce this ecocentric turn to become more indigenous, in definitive, um, to blur this human uh, nature divide together with its hierarchies, because uh, the nature, human nature divide implies uh, hierarchies. So uh, this is what we uh, try to, uh, to, to produce with this uh, uh, digital platform. Marine protected area is not for fun, it's for protecting. 
So we have to bear in mind this. So this implies, as I said, to change this conception of well-being and of having fun in the environment, in the ocean. So to conclude, I think that the moral and ethical angles of our relationship with the nature are those principles that can unite social science and natural science despite differences, despite different approaches, despite different ways of understanding uh, the, uh, the science. I mean that is this, uh, are these principles, moral and ethical principles, um, that unite both uh, uh, the social science and the natural science. And we need to work together in defining these ethical and moral principles. Also to rethink science from a transdisciplinary approach. And this has to be integrated in this idea of ocean literacy, overcoming the old dilemma between science and lay knowledge, subjective, objective, quantitative, qualitative, indigenous or local community, knowledge or science. It is not a question of which is the true science, but which is the science that can produce action-oriented knowledge towards sustainability. That is our purpose in ocean literacy. With knowledge alone, it's not enough. So we must produce this changing. Yes, so, well, uh, this is what we try to produce with our digital uh, platform, Nature Cup, that you can uh, already uh, download, and uh, in the poster exhibit, uh, there's uh, the QR to download and uh, to start uh, learning about uh, the Kelsmari protected area. Thank you, so, thank I think you, you raised the, the, a very good point for the other three speakers to to discuss. No, what yeah. what is really science? No, what is really intelligence? No, is, can we talk about natural or ocean, earth intelligence? that is much beyond our mental or cognitive part, no? is the way we interconnect. No? And I, I think the, this, this uh, event is really an example no? of, of how we interconnect. So, so how, how you could uh, explain children that, that engage them and, and, and encourage them to, to become a science, scientist? No? What is the essential element of of science, of intelligence, of, of natural intelligence. Well, how 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 you think we can pursue the, this question that, in a way, uh, Sylvia posed? Well, uh, maybe it's something. <laughs> it's a tricky question, and there you've said many many different and interesting things that I think I can mix with the the people be, behind. I think it, we are talking about talkers again. We are going back to that. Because you mentioned it, we have been mentioning that. I'm rubbing that uh, that word from you, and you said something that was really interesting. That the what you do in the in the brown impacts in the blue, but maybe from our point of view as researchers, we should change this. We should say what you do, or how the blue impacts on the brown. On the green, sorry. And then, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was confusing the colors. <laughs> Daltonic. Yeah. I think our main job is to introduce the people that, what, that the ocean is a part of my house. It's my ecosystem. It's what we need. It's not only from our point of view as researchers, the, the terrible message of we are going to die, everything is terrible, climate change is changing, mm -hmm. no? So we have to change the relation with the people. So we have to say, well, the sea is there. We have to face many, many different, a lot of problems. There are huge problems that they are really impacting on us. And we have to change this relationship. And the only way, in my opinion, is to say, yes, this is my house. And the ocean is part of my house. I want a clean house. I want a resilient home. I want a predictable home. I want my family to be predictable. Exactly the same things we want for the ocean is exactly the same things I want for my house, for my home. So the only way to have a really good relation to the sea is to say, yes, the ocean is your ecosystem. You are an atmospheric animal. <laughs> we are atmospheric animals. So this is, that's the reason why that is easier for us to understand what's happening on Earth. 
but we need the sea because our climate is the climate we have because we have the sea. We can eat some food because it comes from the sea. We can work because we have the sea. So the only way to change this is to make us understand, the society understand, the importance of being also aquatic animals, because I think I am an aquatic animal. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we, we have a, just a few minutes left. So Donata oh, and Dina. No, no, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's, uh, the, if you want to wrap yeah. up a little bit. Thanks. Just uh, what comes into my mind is that uh, we should um, uh, never stop a kid's curiosity, because uh, kids are curious by nature. So uh, what we can um, uh, do to stimulate their engagement with the, the sea is to respond to their curiosity and to show the linkages uh, of, uh, of the ecosystems, uh, of what happens in the sea and happens in the water, in the, in the, in the land. All these interconnections are fascinating to the kids uh, because they are a kind of adventure into the nature. And uh, I think that uh, um, being able to, uh, to, to dive with them into these uh, interconnections uh, can be a key to stimulate and to answer to their curiosity. And keeping alive this curiosity, I think, is uh, really, really important to uh, improve their, their, their engagement and to answer to your question regarding how to um, improve and uh, um, I don't remember the question, but it was related to <laughs> <laughs> how to uh, make kids uh, interested in uh, ocean science. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Tina, please. Um, I just have um, a few words. Um, in our uh, turquoise house, um, if, we, if we look at the house as a marine institute, or oceanographic agency, or meteorological agency, which are the organizations I work with, and we imagine that marine science is not just one part, for example, the kitchen. <laughs> you know, yeah. We have all different parts in these agencies. And I think what we try to do in Eurogoose uh, ocean literacy work is really promote multi and cross connections between different si disciplines and sectors, which actually all make our house, which is the, uh, the, the Turkish Marine Institute, uh, much more impactful, much more open to new talents, to blue careers, to um, other uh, disciplines makes science better and richer. And this is what makes social literacy so really strategic for, for marine research. And I think um, clearly uh, we, we are on the right track, but still much, much more to do. So. Well, I, I think, I'm, I must say, no, because I've, I'm 66 already. No? I, and, uh, and I've been in many, many meetings and many events, and this has been in over 40 years of experience, the most, most, most collaborative event I've been ever. <laughs> at some points, I thought it was not come, gonna come out, no? But magically, at the end, this collaborative natural intelligence that, that in a way reflects that we are part of a collaborative living earth has come out in this wonderful session and I must congratulate the organizers. Thank you and the Thank speaker. You. Thank you so much. Now to invite on stage uh, panel two that is about communicating ocean literacy in local communities. So it's another, it's another great panel uh, uh, that is going to be moderated by Emilio Beladies Martinez of Plastic Oceans, and the panelists are Noemi Fuster from ICM XIC, Joseph Mendoza from the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Beatrice Patraca di Bildot, sorry for uh, from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and a group of five students from the University of Barcelona are now Berta, Mar, Ada, and Candela. Welcome all.
We are looking forward to hear your stories. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me with these microphones? It's okay, the sound? Okay. So we just uh, leave this one. That's wonderful. So we are going to start with the next panel. Thank you for the bubbles. I love that. <laughs> and today in this, in this panel, we are going to talk about communication on ocean literacy in local communities. Today, we, we have one of the biggest panel uh, of, of all the sessions uh, because of the amazing group of students that we have today here. And as I, as I was thinking like, do we all talk about the no, no blue, no green, that the mention of the Dr. Dr. Sylvia Ayer, and no water, no life. So it's so simple, right, the problem, and it's so hard to get to the solution, but it seems like today we are getting there. We are uh, getting to know a lot of propositions, a lot of initiatives that are really based on success and on collaborative knowledge, as we mentioned in the last panel. So as the time is ticking, I'm going to start just uh, naming the, the panelists and starting with, the, with their presentations, okay? So if you don't mind, the, the, first, group, the first group, sorry, Candela Guerrero, Arnaud Ciprés, Berta Jordan, Ada Ferrer, and Mar Ainud, all present, okay? So please <laughs> introduce, introduce your, your project. Okay, um, hello, good morning. Our project is based to creating a survey to evaluate the Catalonian population knowledge about the ocean, like certain issues and adversities that we may occur in the ocean and in the base. Based on the results and face-to-face -face interaction, we have found that the majority of participants didn't know about citizen science. And we consider this important for all the environment studies to reach the, pollu the population, and in this way, and promote the ocean mindfulness and improve the environment. Okay, this survey, this survey, sorry, this survey was open for 24 days with a participation of 549 people from different parts of Catalonia. Furthermore, this survey is structured in various sections that are knowledge of social literacy, including global warming, and put people in various situations to see their reactions. Another section is fishing, where we ask people if they know the best fishing techniques and its consequence on the marine environment. And the last section is related with this conference and with the decade in that we are in. Because we ask people if they know, sorry, thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we ask people if they know that we are in the ocean decades and the 90% of the people survived didn't know. Also, we ask people if they know that the Conference of the Ocean Decade is here in Barcelona, and the 87% of the people survived didn't know, to, didn't know either. Okay, so this 87% represents more than 475 people that didn't know that this conference exists and that it is being held here in Barcelona. Perfect. Thank you for <laughs> that. <laughs> that's sad, that's sad. I know, that's sad. But I didn't expect that ending. So, uh, Joseph, please introduce the, your initiative. Uh, okay. Yeah? Okay, perfect. Uh, oh, hi, everyone. I'll, I'll yes. Okay, better. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hola a todos y todas. Uh, well, my name is Joseph, and I am part of SOA, SOA Sustainable Ocean Alliance. It's an international organization uh, that uh, actives uh, young people around the world. Uh, in fact, it's the world's largest uh, community of young people working for restore the health of the ocean in our lifetime. So uh, through uh, many programs, and develop and implement innovative solutions. And uh, for us, it's important that uh, point because we consider that the ocean literacy is one of uh, that innovative solutions that we have uh, the possibility to develop and implement in, uh, in different initiatives 
or projects around the world because we are working around the world with different hubs, different uh, teams uh, from Latin America until uh, Europe, Africa, Oceania, etc. So uh, that is uh, more than project for me and for the rest of the people here that is part of SOAIS, uh, a community, a community working uh, based in, in many, many issues, uh, but specifically uh, today uh, for talk about the ocean literacy. Thank you, Joseph. Pass the mic to Beatriz Patraca. Oh, don't need it. Okay, perfect. So Beatriz, whatever you want. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, we are working with Silvia Gomez Mestres in the Empower Us project. Mm -hmm. And our, po our pilot project is, as Silvia says, a uh, nature cap. Uh, Silvia talked about the ocean literacy and the science, and I want to talk about the uh, social project, the participative and community project. And well, uh, our main challenge is the need of, for greeting alignment between the interests of low economy stakeholders and our environmental conservation goals, above all in the way of uh, carrying them out. Mm, we employ an approach of bridging online and offline spaces because it's not about to get a majority project if uh, we want to get involved with all the voices. And the process was very uh, specific because um, we have very specific because we have two workshops. We, uh, the, in the first workshop, we try to get the challenges. And in the second workshop, we try to present to pilots for, for, for the, the stakeholders. But um, we need to do uh, an hybrid solution because uh, someone, some people prefer a digital tool, but the others are um, with uh, some uh, um, avoid of the digital tools. Uh, um, in, we try to, to, to create and continuum online and offline. Well, today talking about online and offline spaces is uh, very old fashioned, but we try to get uh, uh, one project that we uh, preserve the community face-to-face -face experience and the digital solution. And well, in conclusion, Nature Cap stands as a replicable pilot project where coastal communities are empowered, not just users of the sea, but activity guardians and ocean literacy agents. Thank you. Thank you, Beatriz. So, Noemi Fuster, tell you about your experience on the project. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Noemi. I work in this uh, amazing center, the Institute of Marine Science. But from three years uh, ago, uh, there is something that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> How to get real citizen engagement. It all started when the, the main goal of the Mission Ocean was published, to restore our ocean and waters by 2030. Fortunately, we have two leads, uh, networking and citizen engagement. So um, we began by creating a network here in Barceloneta neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's a very small area, but with a broad target. We have uh, the city council, the port, the citizens, the fishermen. So once we made this network, we put it to the test. And we proposed a morning of uh, activities to 30 CEOs of the main companies of the port. Uh, activities such as um, mindfulness at the beach, snorkeling by learn more about biodiversity, uh, also um, removing surface waste. Mm -hmm. And we visit um, environmental and information center, the Centro de la Plata. In the beginning and at the end, we did a profile of mood states test. This test identifies 34 different emotions and you have to mark the ones that you feel connected to. The results show a decrease in negative emotions such as hopeless, helpless, or sadness and an increase in positive emotions such as happiness, confidence, and commitment. So indicating that when they finished the activities, people had a more proactive 
and committed attitude. So we got it. We got it. <laughs> Using a local network to do immersive activities in the ocean seems like a necessary uh, step to get citizen engagement uh, in ocean restoration. But then another question came up. What is ocean? Does the ocean represent the same thing to all the people on the planet? Then we did, we did a survey among citizens um, in Barcelona and in Sanyang, in Gambia. It showed us a difference when it came to defining the ocean. In Barceloneta, the, more, the words that represent the ocean were freedom, water, and life. But in Sanyang, in Gambia, the most common words were income, fish, and God. And this last word is really <coughs> interesting because in some cultures, uh, the, the health of the ocean is measured by science. But in other cultures, the ocean is a gift from God. And it's believed that God will always provide fish. <coughs> so if the concepts of the ocean are so different, we must look into the cultural background. It's necessary to consider this if we have to face such a big challenge as recover the ocean by 2030. A challenge of this magnitude requires a planetary commitment um, in order to restore the ocean in record time. So in conclusion, mm -hmm. we believe that the first steps to get real citizen engagement are Find the activity that uh, makes the biggest impact in our emotions. You can use the, the profile of the States test. Please do a survey. Do a survey before to find out what ocean means in order to know what approach to take and what communication will be most effective. And, of course, involve local networks with the same cultural background. You have more information with better grammar and better vocabulary in, on the poster outside. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Eid Mubarak to the all Muslim community. Thank you. Amy. As, we have, as we have some minutes left, I'm going to ask you uh, one question to each group. So be ready. OK? Are you prepared? Yeah? <laughs> so the university group, according to your results, uh, what aspect of ocean knowledge or ocean literacy do you think should be enhanced? Well, we think that uh, general knowledge about the oceans should be enhanced, especially uh, things such as uh, how to act in emergency situations, like uh, getting uh, sorry, like getting a jellyfish sting, because we found that about 60% of the people we interviewed didn't know how to properly uh, treat such a common uh, occurrence uh, nowadays. And also to like uh, enhance certain areas of knowledge like blue carbon, which we found to be a area that was very much lacking in knowledge because we asked um, or participants to like rank uh, certain topics, uh, like to say, uh, which topic do you know about the most, which less, and we found that uh, blue carbon, which is a crucial um, thing to know nowadays due to climate change and such, um, was one of the topics that, peop that uh, less people knew about. So we should try to like enhance those areas in knowledge. You can find further information on the Let's poster up there. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Pass the mic to Soa, to Joseph. Yeah. And as it has been said in the other panels uh, about the generational topic, uh, generational barriers, like the youth is not really engaged, but today we have this example. You are an example of youth engaged on ocean literacy. So. How does your organization so engage with the youth to encourage them to be like a speaker of the ocean? Well, in our case, uh, well, in my case also, uh, uh, so I have uh, uh, different programs. Uh, I was uh, talking about it, uh, but I kind of put the focus on one of the, that programs, uh, Ocean Leadership Program, uh, because with that program, or through that program, uh, the idea is, um, um, uh, facilitate tool, tools for the young people around the world. Uh, for example, offer uh, capacity building, uh, mentorship, uh, funding, researches that are very important. 
And yeah, through that uh, uh, different uh, researches, we have the possibility to uh, develop and implement, for example, initiatives or projects around the world, based, for example, in ocean literacy, uh, and work uh, near to the uh, communities, uh, communities from uh, Chile, for example, from uh, uh, here in Spain. Uh, so that is the uh, um, uh, the main point of uh, of the SOA uh, working through this uh, this program. And yeah, uh, understanding that the most important thing when we are talking about ocean literacy is uh, promote the uh, that the people uh, understand how. Uh, the ocean influence uh, on us and how we uh, influence on uh, on the ocean. So that that is the the the, the information. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. So Beatriz, with her own mic, uh, I have an, another question because you you were talking about the app that was mentioned on the, the last panel. So I want to know like, how was the experience of co-creation? You know, this. Um, how was, to, how was the co-creation experience of building a communication tool with such a variety of partners? Because you talk about online, offline, I guess it's different profiles, so it, it sounds like a challenge. Yes, it was very challenging because uh, the stakeholders of this area, Cap de Creus mm -hmm. uh, area, are uh, very um, historical stakeholders and have a, a very heavy participation in all process, social processes. And well, we know before the, the workshops, we know that being impossible to, to be according to one solution. And we are um, prepared for, mm -hmm. for this situation. But um, at last we find a, a, a formula uh, with an mm -hmm. hybrid solution. And for example, for the, for the app, we collected photographies, uh, images, uh, questions for all the community and tried to, uh, everyone was uh, represented by the, the, the app, for example. Okay. But it was very difficult Sorry. process. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you, Beatriz. And the last one, Noemi, with your experience, because you talk about the contrast of the survey doing it in Barcelona and uh, in Africa, in Ghana, you say, you mentioned? Gambia. Gambia. Okay, uh, with your experience, do you think direct experiences with the ocean may change people's perception of the ocean, like from sad to happiness? Yes, definitely, I think so. But also, um, I think it's important to to um, to know the cultural background, as mm -hmm. I said, and also. I would like uh, to add the personal experience with the ocean. We cannot propose the same activity to someone that, have, uh, uh, that has a judge in, in Cap de Creus that to someone uh, who crossed by boat from uh, Tunisia to Lampedusa mm -hmm. because the experience with the ocean will not be the same. So the starting point must be different. Does it mean that they should be excluded? No, because it's a global uh, goal for all the humanity. Mm -hmm. So I have two things uh, clear. Um, no one can be left behind, mm -hmm. but uh, one size doesn't fit all. That's true, that's true. So I think we are running out of time today in this, in this panel. So thank you everyone for listening. And as you have seen, uh, we have different initiatives of trying to communicate this ocean literacy. and. I guess to wrap up is like we need to get spend more time in the water. So let's do that.
Thank you once again to our panelists and thank you Emilio for the perfect synthesis for your panel. And now we are ready for another, another great discussion that is the last of our event today. So our fourth panel is about ocean literacy and water sports. It will be moderated by Natalie Fox of the ECO program and Citizens of Surf. And our panelists are Lucy Hunt from the Ocean Race and the Irish Social Literacy Network, Maibe Hermoso from Buseo Conciencia, <laughs> Giovanna Scagnolato from Tata Uga and Sustainable Ocean, Ocean Alliance Campinas, and Anna Sanchez Vidal from the University of Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And so, yes, on that note, we should spend more time in the water. We have our, our amazing panelists that are all working in, on, or under the water and have ocean literacy integrated into their activities and impact. So we don't have much time left, so we're going to stick with one question, and we'll try to have a lot of information in that one question. And I just encourage you to take the QR code so that you can have more information about each of the projects. Um, we're going to start with Lucy, who has sure. managed to make it here <laughs> across town in the Barcelona traffic. Um, the culture of professional sports is based on competition. And so tell us a bit about the ocean race, which is very exciting and uh, engaging competition. How do you leverage that um, to encourage a more collaborative um, and like, caring <laughs> sense for the ocean? Yeah, thanks very much, Nat, and lovely to be here with you all. Um, some great panels ahead of, before us, so thank you. Um, so the ocean race is an around-the-world sailing race. It's pretty epic. It lasts for about six to nine months, and it happens every four years. And it's the pinnacle of sailors' career. It's like an ev the Everest for them. So we actually have a whole sustainability program called Racing with Purpose. It, uh, the race itself is now known as um, as the mo having the most comprehensive scientific program because we've science on board and I'd like to extend that to a sporting event with probably the most comprehensive ocean literacy program as well because we have our resources for primary school and secondary schools um, developed in 11 languages that are rolled out in 80 different countries with over 250,000 students um, since it started in, in 2017. And so, yeah, it's a competition, it's grueling. Uh, the sailors are amazing to be out there. And for the students, it's really engaging, it's exciting because they get to see these amazing hum human beings, but they get inspired by them because they think one day maybe I can be out there too. And then for the racers, it's really nice for them because they can engage with students and they can talk to them about what they're seeing out on the ocean. So some of the things that they're seeing is, you know, less wildlife over the years and more plastic pollution. And some of the exercises then that we ask through our ocean literacy program is to imagine that you're an ocean racer and imagine what you might be seeing out there and how would you communicate it. So it gets them into that thinking of being out there on the ocean, connecting with the ocean. And then part of our program is when we go to the different host cities around the world, and there can be up to eight host cities in that six months, um, we engage thousands of kids and invite them down to the race village. So we have a whole ocean literacy program, which is like an exhibition, and they go to different workshops and have lots of hands-on um, experience and get to see the boats and some of the sailors as well. So it's really engaging and inspiring. And then just to let you know, our Generation Ocean program, which is our secondary school learning program, it was the first ever um, ocean literacy resource that started to talk or uh, started to have content on that ecocentric sort of viewpoint. So talking around ocean rights and, and viewing the ocean as a person that's in itself. So a very different way to our anthropocentric sort of viewing, which Sylvia, I think, was speaking about when I came in earlier. So it's a, it, there's some really great resources. It helps to inspire kids. It helps them to like learn about the ocean in, the, in an exciting way as well. So yeah, if anyone wants to talk to it a bit more, because there's a lot more to it, <laughs> um, I'd love to speak to you after. Amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lucy. And so talking about that observation of people being out at sea, 
diving is if, is a different way of uh, observing the ocean, maybe a lot slower and a lot less rough. So talk to us, Maeve, about your work and how you're transforming the consciousness of divers. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, in my case, my project uh, was born uh, from the result of my thesis, of my doctoral thesis. I was um, trying to understand how divers wanted to participate in citizen science projects. Uh, we found that they, they wanted uh, to participate a lot, uh, but they, uh, their main barrier was the, their knowledge about marine biology, and they really, wa they really wanted to learn about marine bi biology, but they didn't know how to do that. No? They don't have like a, a recourse to, to do that. So I uh, funded Buceo Conciencia, that it is an... Um, uh, we are creating like an uh, innovative uh, experience in education in marine biology, specifically for scuba diving industry. We have uh, marine online courses, um, very like um, dynamic, visuals, fans, no? because we are teaching for people who do that by recreation. Um, we also have um, like the typical diving trip, to Maldives, Red Sea, or something like that. Um, but with the main uh, objective to learn about the marine biodiversity in these uh, places. Um, we have leaders also, um, the uh, world um, record, <laughs> uh, the, um, the number of uh, scuba diver participating in citizen science in one day, no? with here with Observadores del Mar in the ISM. Um, and that kind of things is what we do. What uh, our main uh, objective is uh, to teach diver about marine biology, to uh, for empower them uh, to lead their marine conservation initiative. Uh, because we think they are very uh, important uh, or strategic group of marine user because they are who they are the witness of what is happening under the sea they can uh, detect um, pollution points they can they are the first who can see an invasive species and they they are who uh, feel the chain in the under the sea, no, in the marine ecosystem, so um, they are very strategic. They, but uh, to get this, um, we we need them to know about marine biology to have all this uh, thing from there, no. So um, uh, with Buceo Conciencia, we are trying to empower them uh, through ocean literacy. Uh, uh, from the knowledge, no? And we have, uh, say a lot of time, like the no green, no blue. Mm -hmm. And from Buceo Conciencia, we say uh, no black, no blue, because we really think we need the divers and power mm -hmm. to marine conservation and the protection of the sea. <laughs> nice, thank you. Um, so there's like a, a a jump there from ocean literacy to then um, being marine citizen scientists. So Anna, this is your work. You have been using different tools to engage uh, ocean users. So introduce us to your project. I had a go at it this morning, actually. Thanks Mind to sure. you. Yeah, thanks to you and Ori. So thank you, Natalie. Experience. So yes, in, in like uh, six years ago, we designed it. We invented a manta troll to collect uh, floating plastics from the very near shore. In fact, it's there because I use it this morning. Riol, if you want to just show a little bit. This is a very easy to use and cheap, affordable manta troll that can be towed from uh, surf boards, uh, rowing boats, uh, kayaks, uh, whatever floating uh, device. So with this manta troll, we built a citizen science initiative. We have around 15 of these uh, uh, trolls that we give to uh, different NGOs, uh, enterprises, uh, local governments, so they collect samples for us. 
uh, together with the help uh, of uh, Survivor Foundation, we have this project that's called Surfing for Science. And uh, well, we have been able to uh, collect and characterize, characterize, so we know the size, the area, the color, the shape, the origin, and the polymer of more than 100,000 uh, microplastics. So this has been a huge effort. How we communicate the results, so we didn't know when we started how to disseminate the results, so increase awareness. So we have an Instagram account that, that's called uh, Surfing for Science Lab, where we put all the scientific samples there. And we also made some of these t-shirts uh, in order to uh, have a lot of disseminators. So this is a scientific sample. Uh, obtained it uh, just uh, here in the Barceloneta beach a couple of years ago where you can see all the plastics floating and you can identify the origins of the plastic. So our aim is that people uh, do the same that as I'm doing now, that look, this is artificial turf, these are micro beads, these are pellets, uh, these are fragments, um, these are films. So we want people to disseminate our results. and. And I'm going to talk a little bit, just a minute, about another project uh, that's called the OSIS project that in order to increase uh, uh, awareness uh, in kids doing sports, we are trying to build tools. Uh, so we have there uh, a lot of the participants <laughs> of the project. Uh, that uh, we have like four pilot interventions with different uh, sports, surf, uh, diving, um, sailing and kayaking in different countries and Portugal, Spain, uh, France and, and Malta. So we are going to test uh, how to increase their awareness while uh, they are doing sports. Uh, so you can see in the new brand uh, website, uh, oses.eu, I think it was mm -hmm. new yesterday. It's on the poster. <laughs> ah, there's a poster. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we're going to go across to Giovanna. So um, we're talking about this relationship that we have with the ocean. And these three projects are really focusing on what we can kind of do as humans for the ocean. And Giovanna, your project is different in the sense that your ocean literacy work is help, helping enable local communities to become more resilient. So tell us a bit about yeah. what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm a Giovanna, I'm a, a coordinator of Transform Our Project, and Transform Our Project, we, we, we disseminate environmental education and ocean literacy for young people in social vulnerab vulnerability uh, situation, uh, and these young, they study in public schools in Brazil, and uh, they, they live in coastal areas. Uh, we offer a ocean literacy course, and after we take them to explore the underwater world with a scuba dive. We use scuba dive as a tool. And uh, we, we believe this unique and uh, wonderful experience can transform them. Uh, I don't know uh, the reality in other countries, but in Brazil, we have a huge difference uh, between public schools and private schools. Uh, in, in, and uh, topics such as uh, environmental education, ocean literacy, uh, usually is not addressed for them in public schools. So we try to, to, to stop this gap um, and... Uh, and uh, change this because the, these young they they face daily with uh, uh, humans impacts like climate change, uh, overfishing, ocean pollution. Of course, this affect all the people. But them, uh, they live in coastal areas, and that the, their sustain came from ocean or, or coastal environments. And. Uh, uh, how the access is limited for them about these these topics? They don't know. They offer, they usually don't know how to advocate for their rights. So we try to 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 pass the knowledge for them and uh, encourage them to to advocate for their space, their lives, their their environment, their their ocean. We truly believe uh, we only take care of what we love and we just love what we know and understand. 
So uh, we try to, to, to do this for, for them and for all the people. I think uh, because this is the point where we're supposed to end the event, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll open the floor just to see if anyone has a question. And if not, we can maybe wrap up and then we will be finishing on time because I'm sure everyone has got a very busy day. Um, so if there are any questions, then go for it. I have a question, actually. <laughs> um, my question is, um, so it's easy to see how water sports and ocean literacy go together and can help us as humans and also help the ocean. But what about other sports where water is not involved? How, how can we get ocean literacy out beyond these kind of um, blue spaces? Any ideas? Maybe to the audience as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think water sports can can be a great uh, tool to to ocean literacy, especially scuba diving. Uh, when you can see the marine life with your own eyes, mm. breathing in the water, it's it's amazing. It's indescribable. So I think it's a a, a good a good tool, but. Uh, it's difficult because uh, in Brazil, uh, scuba diving, it's a elite sport. It's, a, it's very expensive. It's not accessible for many. <laughs> so uh, we need to, to, to be partnerships, uh, fundings to, to provide this for uh, social vulnerability communities uh, and this. <laughs> Um, yeah, just quickly, I suppose, as well, the ocean race lends itself to ocean literacy, but I think there are innovative ways that we can engage other communities. We are all ocean citizens. We all breathe the same air that is created by Mother Ocean. So in, there's definitely creative people out there that can help in campaigns. You know, if it's a football game, there could be some cool billboards or things like that. You know, there's definitely ways that we can be innovative when it comes to communicating about the ocean. Because at this, like, it's that whole thing of communicating. We're all part of the one system. We're all in this universe together, all breathing the same air, all, all of us working towards the same things. But there's many other people that aren't even aware. So if we can engage those people through these different sports that you're saying, you know, there, it gives you so much hope. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In my case, I just uh, want to say that uh, when I was in my studies about the participation in citizen science, what I feel is that uh, when you are working with a community that is previous, uh, that previous exists, exists is like easier to make them to participate in science. No? So in this case, just like a, if they are in a, in a sport uh, community, you, you can like invite them, talk to them in their idiom, in, with their interest, to try to get to closer to the ocean or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and just <laughs> one thing to add, if, if we engage the sporting heroes, like so our sailors are advocates for the ocean, but if you have the messies of football or whoever it is getting engaged, they bring their fans with them. So it is about like connecting with people so that and offering them those ocean experiences so that they know how important the ocean is. And then they can also bring thousands of people with them once they start talking about it. OK, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Thank you to all of my panelists. And uh, thank you, Maria. I think we're wrapping up. So, yeah, I'm gonna, should we stay? <laughs> we had, well, it's not important, we had just a last slide. Uh, goodbye, but no, thank you very much all. I hope you all uh, enjoyed as much as I did these wonderful stories from uh, all over the world, actually. And uh, is, uh, um, with this journey, so today we have discovered we have, uh, we, so many ways to bring ocean literacy uh, out there. So as I said at the beginning of the event, to connect ourselves with the ocean. But we don't want this journey to finish today. 
our intention after this event is to continue uh, bringing uh, more the knowledge of uh, all the different ways we can uh, sorry <laughs> create this connection change this relationship between us and the, uh, and the ocean through uh, a white paper. So we want to bring together all the results of this conversation today, all the, these uh, wonderful stories we've heard today, and uh, we want to hear from you. So we want to hear your feedback about these stories, your own experiences. So over the following weeks, we will uh, share with you a draft of this paper, and we will love for you to give all the feedback um, you may not have had a chance to share with us today. So thank you all very much for being here today. It's, it has been really a pleasure for me. And thank you to all the panelists and the moderators and all the organizers. <laughs>